Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your patience. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties, but we have worked very hard to make it possible for the people on Zoom to also see us. Um, so everybody on Zoom, <laughs> we were working hard for you and we're so glad you're here. Uh, my name is Allison Alexi. I'm an associate professor here and happy to be part of the Center for Japanese Studies. Um, it's really my pleasure today to get to be here to learn from Dr. Cook and to hear all your questions and comments. Um, before we get started, I have a few announcements. The first is if that anyone is hearing impaired or would find it helpful to have printed text of the talk that Professor Cook is about to give, we have those available. Um, so they're not for taking home, right? But for, for uh, reading through right now, if that'd be helpful, please do reach out. Um, Alexis has and can raise um, their hand, right? So please reach out to Alexis if that would be helpful to you. Um, it would also be great if you wouldn't mind wearing a mask during the talk. Um, Professor Cook, we have put them on the table. Professor Cook is about to go on a tour <laughs> of giving presentations and is trying to stay as healthy as possible. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great but it's of course up to you. So next week, um, let's click over here. Uh-oh. Please, please pause. So this whole time I've been like, oh my God, this is my opportunity to stand up. It's gonna be terrible and I'm gonna have such a good time. So now, oh, never mind. We missed the, the window. Okay, next week. Thank you. Next week, same time, wait, no, same day, different time, we'll have the next lecture in our series, N Naomi Fukuda, Backseat Player for Japanese Studies, um, which will be at 5 p.m. and online only. So this means someone is um, Zooming in from Japan probably, um, and that's very, very generous of them. So please do join us online for this presentation next week. That same evening, a week from today, there will be the sixth entry in the Diamonds by the Decade, the best of CGS 75th anniversary film series. I'm looking at you, Marcus. Um, the screening of the 1980s film, Tom Popo, which anyone who's seen it knows how to say it. It's amazing and hilarious and, and fantastic. Um, and probably the diametric opposite of what was shown last time, right? Like <laughs> not, creep, not creepy, just hilarious. Not creepy, just hilarious. Um, the first Japanese studies course I took as a student uh, showed this film. <laughs> so it's like happy nostalgic memories for me. Um, so that will be at the State Theater, um, theater number one at 7.15 p.m. Um, and more information and tickets are available on the Michigan Theater website. Please do join us. I'm also very happy to share um, a new art exhibit has opened in Lane Hall. Um, many of you probably re maybe remember we sent out a notification because we asked for your feedback and suggestions both for artists to, to invite and for feminists to feature. Um, so the exhibit is up. I find it really, really moving and powerful um, and would love it if you're able to stop by. It's in Lane Hall, which is uh, next to Buffalo Wild Wings. So you can stop by and have lunch at the same time you see some feminist art. Um, it will be up through May and we will be having a celebration that everyone is welcome to probably in March. We're still figuring out the date. All right, for those attendees joining us through the webinar, webcams and microphones have been muted. But we invite you to use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions you have, and the presenters, presenter will try to um, respond as much as possible. The live transcription closed captioning is enabled, but if you'd rather not have it, just go to the bottom right corner and disable it. Please check out our CJS events page, our various social media for lectures during the winter 2023 season. So I want to say it's really my pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Cook today. Um, she is our Toyota visiting professor this year, and we're so incredibly lucky to have her. She's trained as a what I would call a cultural anthropologist and you would call a social anthropologist um, and holds a PhD from SOAS and is now an associate professor at Hokuda, Hokudai University, uh, Hokkaido University. Her first book came out in 2015 and is titled Reconstructing Adult Masculinities, Part-Time Work on contemporary, in Contemporary Japan. I, I find myself recommending this book all the time. I was actually on a podcast last week and someone asked me about my favorite example in my own book. And I cited me citing her from her book, <laughs> um, which is true, it's recorded. Um, so it's a fa fabulous book, just full of incredibly vibrant examples. 
Um, today, she'll be talking about her newer book project on food allergies. Um, and we'll be giving a presentation called Reading the Air and Creating Trouble, Food Allergy Disclosures in Japan. Um, I was thinking, I knew this presentation was coming up and I was thinking about it a lot last week um, when earlier this week, actually, I'm giving a talk in a few months at a different university. And I got this nice email from the person organizing it that said, oh, great, we're going to be organizing your dinner. Um, tell us who you want to have come to the dinner. And I, I had this moment where, as you might or might know, there's some loved ones who are um, immunocompromised in my family, so we stay masked and we don't go out. So I had this moment where I had to say, um, I'm sorry, I'd, I'd prefer not to go to dinner, or I can go to dinner, but I'll be masked the whole time, which is kind of weird. Or I can go for walks with people, like I'm trying to give all these other um, options. And I was thinking, I was so surprised by the discomfort I felt in that moment. I felt so embarrassed to ask. They're just trying to be nice. I'm just trying to be nice. We're all trying to be professional. And I was thinking about that in relation to Professor Cook's work um, as these moments of disclosure. Um, in this case, mine was really a request. It's a preference, right? I am not the one who's immunocompromised. I'm trying to protect two moms, basically. Um, but I was thinking that I expect that we have all had those kinds of moments where you have to make choices about disclosure, maybe you have food allergies yourself, maybe around COVID and COVID practices, the kind of risk that you, you feel comfortable with versus the risk that say your friends or family do. We're all sort of negotiating these in different ways, certainly during, during the pandemic. So without further ado, I really look forward to learning from you and from hearing your talk. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming Professor Emma Cook. Well, <clears throat> Thank you very much for a very kind welcome. First of all, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Um, if the mic goes out at any point, please don't hesitate to tell me. Um, I'd also really like to just say thank you very much to all the CGS staff, uh, the students, the, the faculty members who have been so incredibly welcoming this year. I feel incredibly privileged to have been able to be here with you. And I'm pretty sad that I'll be leaving in March. Um, but anyway, without ado, let me get on with the talk. Uh, for those of you who hate kind of trying to figure out how long a person is going to talk for, it's a 45 minute talk uh, right in the middle of the 40 to 50 minutes that I was given. So if you start getting tired, don't worry, it will end. OK, so let's start. When people know about my food allergies, the air gets bad one young woman confided during a workshop I was conducting with young adults in 2017. Others in the group nodded in agreement. It was a conundrum these young people were used to. Managing food allergies is not just about managing food ingestion, but is also about handling social interactions. Food scholars have made the point that food is, and I quote, the basic foundation of culture and society. Way back in 1922, more than 100 years ago now, Radcliffe Brown argued that food not only has a social value, which can significantly affect social life, but is integral to the emotional life of the community. Furthermore, food, he argued, is how a person comes to feel that they are a member of a community. Furthermore, food, he argued, um, sorry, uh, the importance of food in the constitution of community is also illustrated by Onuki Tierney, actually a previous T TVP here, who has argued that, and I quote, one of the most important aspects of food is its role, both in ritual and in daily life, in bringing people together, in giving them a sense of community. By sharing food, and especially by eating the same kinds of food together, people form the bonds of social relationship. For most of the young people I've worked with since 2017, the management of social situations is a substantial part of managing their allergies and constitutes a considerable part of their concern, and for some, distress. Telling people about their allergies, when and how, is something that is often thought about and imagined. How will others respond to a disclosure of their allergies? This consideration goes hand in hand with how they read and interpret the air, what is called kuki or yomu in Japan. At the workshops I facilitated and attended with young adults, feelings and emotions swirl, sometimes explicitly, at other times as an undercurrent in the recounting of painful, difficult, affirmative or supportive social experiences in the context of eating and the disclosure or not of food allergies. 
I imagine all of you in this room know of or have heard about food allergies, but I want to take a brief moment to introduce them so that we're all on the same page. At its simplest, uh, allergies are basically overreactions of the immune system to something that is normally harmless. Uh, and in this case, it's food proteins. It's possible to be allergic to any food, but in Japan, the top seven allergens that are mandatory to label on prepackaged food are egg, milk, wheat, crab, shrimp, buckwheat, and peanuts. In mid-2022, it was announced that walnuts will be added to the list. In addition, the Consumer Affairs Agency recommends the labeling of 21 other allergens, which are all up here. It's, it's a big old list, um, almond, cashew nut, walnut at the moment, abalone, squid, salmon, roe, salmon, mackerel, beef, chicken, sesame, soybean, pork, matsutake, mushroom, yam, banana, peach, orange, kiwi, apple, and gelatin. Uh, may contain labeling in Japan is not permitted. Um, so they have to test to a certain level and then they have to label uh, based on the presence or absence. In the US, meanwhile, it's quite different. Uh, the major allergens in legislation consist of eight, well now nine foods, milk, egg, fish, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, and soybeans. And so they group tree nuts and they group fish together. And shellfish is also grouped as one big category. Uh, sesame has been added since this month as well. May contain labeling is allowed, but it is not required in the US. And so there's a whole range of different manufacturing practices and it can be quite complicated for people to manage. There are a growing number of people around the world who have food allergies or true food allergies, which are IgE mediated. So those are the ones that are the immune response. Um, most people discover them when they're children, but there are also an increasing number of adult onset food allergies where people have been able to eat, for example, tree nuts for 50 years, and then suffer an allergic reaction out of the blue. In Japan, it's estimated that around 4.5% of school-aged children, 5 to 10% of infants, and 1.3 to 4.5% of adults have food allergies. The severity appears to be increasing, and there's also an increase in hospitalizations in Japan. This doesn't seem to be just from increased knowledge about food allergy, and therefore a trip to the ER but from an increase in the severity of reactions, though it is admittedly hard to find in-depth decent data on this. Okay, doesn't wanna move. Sorry, the slides are having a fit. There we go. Thank you so much, Alexis. Brilliant, thank you. Allergic reactions can vary from mild to severe. And in severe cases, individuals can experience what is called anaphylaxis, which is defined as a reaction of more than one bodily system. Uh, symptoms can include hives, swollen throat or other area, areas of the body, hoarse voice, wheezing, dizziness, passing out, chest tightness, trouble breathing and swallowing, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach cramping, and a feeling of impending doom. If they have a known food, drug, or insect venom allergy or have had anaphylaxis before, people should have been given epinephrine or adrenaline auto-injectors, and this is the first line treatment response. I want to take a moment to say here that if you see or you know someone, or you yourself, are having a severe allergic reaction that, that basically in incorporates two bodily systems, please call 911. They or you should use the epinephrine, the adrenaline auto-injector. It should be injected into the outer thigh, which is um, should have been shown on these slides, but for some reason it's not coming up fully. Uh, but basically it's in the outer thigh. Um, if you've never done this before or had training in it, it's very easy, but please don't be swayed by movie or TV shows that show auto-injectors being stabbed into the heart. That is definitely not what you want to do, outer thigh. Uh, you should then make sure that the person lies flat with their lower legs up on a chair or, and if they're struggling, or if they're struggling to breathe or, or they're vomiting, they should sit up but keep their lower legs elevated. Don't let them move around. It's it can be really dangerous if you let them stand up. If there's no improvement after five to ten minutes, they should use a second auto-injector if they have one. After that, they have to be monitored for a few hours in hospital. Um, death is admittedly rare. But it happens. So I think it's important. Um, and I thought for me doing research on this, I think it's also an important part of my job as a researcher just to let you all, all know 
how to deal with it if you see it. So anyway, back to the talk. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry this slide didn't come up properly. Okay, today's talk focuses on how people with allergies in Japan read and manage the air around them to greater and lesser extents, to oftentimes try and prevent their allergies and themselves from causing trouble or meiwaku. To read the air is, able, is to be able to read others' bodies, affects, and emotions, and is also a process of imagination. Part of reading other people's affects involves a capacity to perceive what these affects, postures, and expressions signify. Reading the air correctly does not, however, necessarily lead to easy social relations with no trouble caused to others or oneself. The ways people disclose or don't disclose can be troublesome, even though they're trying to avoid it, depending, of course, on what their in interlocutors themselves think about food allergies. Moreover, while some allergic individuals decide not to disclose their allergies because they, are imagine, they imagine and are afraid of disrupting the atmosphere, this can end up causing trouble which they had hoped to avoid. So reading the air and trying to avoid trouble are really fraught processes which rely on reading bodies as well as imagining and interpreting others' feelings and potential responses. I want to take a moment to note here, however, that concern with not causing trouble is not specific or unique to Japan. People with food allergies in the UK are also concerned about these aspects and are attentive to their social and material environments. However, meiwaku and kuki oyomu are concepts that have embedded within them expectations and norms of behavior that are culturally mediated in particular ways in Japan. Today, I'm going to draw on narratives from a series of young adult workshops I've co facilitated since 2017 with a nonprofit organization that supports people with allergic disease in Japan. It's one part of a broader project on experiences of food allergies in Japan, where I've done participant observation at multiple events, workshops, lectures, and summer camps, as well as conducted interviews with various stakeholders. I've also participated in and helped facilitate 19 young adult workshops to date. Participant numbers have ranged typically from six to 12 individuals from age 15 to 26, and they last between two to three hours each time. You'll see today that the participants don't always agree with each other's strategies or ways of thinking about disclosure, but these workshops were important spaces for learning about different positionalities, strategies, and what matters to them. I feel sorry when people around me know about my food allergies and have to care or pay attention to my needs. I worry about what kind of reaction people around me will have when they know about my food allergies. Even though I couldn't eat the sweets my friend's mother put out, I felt sorry about leaving them. So I forced myself to eat some, and then I had an allergic reaction. I'm always at a loss about the timing of when to tell about my allergies. These four short comments encompass some of the common worries that young adults have in managing their food allergies, and they all pertain either directly or indirectly to changes in air or atmosphere. Disclosure makes some feel that their food allergies may take extra care on their behalf, and they need, may read that as a burden on the people around them, or they may imagine and feel that the efforts others have made on their behalf without knowledge of their allergies leads them to ingest an allergen despite the risk because they don't want to hurt their feelings. They may also worry about what kinds of reactions others will have to them when they declare their allergies. Reading the air, kuki o yomu, or being able to, is something that is highly valued in Japan, as any of you who have been in Japan, which I imagine is most of you, already know. Of course, awareness of the air or atmosphere is not specific to Japan. Brennan, for example, wrote in her 2004 book titled Transmission of Affect uh, and said, is there anyone who has not at least once walked into a room and felt the atmosphere? Or as White has asked, and I quote, is there anyone who has not walked into a room and not felt the atmosphere? Brennan argues that all, although the, and I quote, the transmission of effect was once common knowledge, the concept faded from the history of scientific explanation in the West as the individual, especially the biologically determined individual, came to the fore, end quote. Atmospheres are ever present. There's one in here right now today. There's probably more than one, actually. 
Uh, they're influenced by affects that emerge from social interactions, and they have physical and biological effects on the bodies of those present. Reading the air, knowing how to do it, and the practice of it is intersubjective and based on pre-existing embodied experience. I argue that it is a skill that is developed over time to greater and lesser extents. And to quote Kimura, he says, it functions as one of the most powerful cultural representations in social communications in Japan, end quote. People who can't read the air, kuki or yomenai, or KY for short, are often considered to be problematic because of the trouble or the mewaku they cause to others. As Kimura has argued in Japan, and I quote, people constantly feel pressure to attune to the predominating kuki or air. In order to engage in social communications in a proper manner, they try to detect what kuki they are in and then what to say and how to behave in the kuki. Of course, kuki is never a given fact. It is a subtle, intersubjective atmosphere generated, constructed, and constantly changing through the incessant negotiation of people involved. Disclosing food allergies, which is usually understood to simultaneously be declaring difference, can consequently become moments of rupture in social interactions, especially when it's done in a social setting, including food, which is usually a space for the forging and strengthening of social relations through eating. It can be a source of mewaku, which can be understood, of course, in English as burden, nuisance, trouble for others, or causing trouble. Causing trouble to others is typically something not to be taken lightly and is often considered and calculated. Children are taught to avoid being mewaku on others. Old people are often afraid of causing it. For example, back in 1998, Trap Hagen has argued in the context of the elderly that, I quote, there are times when one cannot avoid causing mewaku, and those instances require calculation as to whether a relationship is sufficiently close or strong to allow for behavior that burdens another, end quote. More recently, Kavetsia has argued that mewaku was a prevalent feeling among the elderly she worked with, and that, I quote, in order to create and maintain social ties and networks of support, people were cautious not to impose, balancing attention between sociality and stifling social relationships, or between supportive, friendly relationships and excessive closeness, end quote. This work indicates that the concern with causing trouble to another is one that considerably inflects social relations in Japan. Daniel White, in his 2022 book, Administering Affect, argues, however, that mewaku is less about knowing what you shouldn't do and more about feeling it. Mewaku operates, he says, and I quote, through experiences that are once social and somatic, end quote. So how do you know you're being mewaku? You read the air, you feel it. This reading takes place via bodily capacities. For White, and he says, bodies that develop these capacities learn to navigate social space with ease and reduce mewaku. He says they can navigate social spaces smoothly without feeling frustration or, frustra or resistance. I would argue, however, that this is really complicated when visible or invisible illness or disability are present. For people with food allergies, eating out necessitates creating a certain amount of mewaku, particularly to wait staff and chef who need to be conscious of the risks and careful to create safe food. Many of the people that I work with are skilled at reading the air. They feel the mewaku. They take steps to try and mitigate it but they also feel resistance and frustration at what their allergy disclosures do to the air. So it's really implicated in knowing when and how much burden is acceptable, but it's also really a possibility to shift the mood, right? For people with food allergies, the emphasis is usually focused on maintaining a particular mood or trying not to move the mood into a different slash bad direction so as not to create trouble. So disclosing an inability to eat something when out socially is, is a delicate communicative practice. So about 10 teenagers who are all very blurred here because you know I wanna maintain their anonymity uh, and teens and young adults are basically gathered in a noisy atrium. They range in age from 14 to 25. We drag stools into a rough circle for a three hour workshop on their experiences. After breaking the ice, we turn our attention to current concerns. 
One of the participants ventured to the group that she was unsure to what extent do people understand food allergies and to what extent will they show their understanding? She was uncertain about how it would affect not just her physical safety, but also her social relations. 19-year-old Sakaguchi-san followed this comment by linking understanding of allergies directly to the air. She said, I worry about the air becoming bad. Even if people do understand, I feel a bit bad that they then have to take care or be careful on my behalf. Then if I have a reaction and they realize and become concerned and they say, are you okay? I feel miserable about it. It's a problem of feeling miserable. My friends will be careful for me if they're eating my allergens and I mention I can't eat it because I'm allergic. But on the other hand, I feel sorry about it towards them. Sakaguchi-san is always concerned about what her disclosure does to the air and the trouble it causes to others, but also to herself, the misery she feels. Concern for the quality of the, of the air can also be complicated in Japan by social hierarchies. For example, 20-year-old Yamamoto-san recounted an experience she had at university. She said, recently, I went out to an izakaya with a university professor and three others. The professor ordered an expensive prawn dish and said to everyone to absolutely please eat this. I wasn't really sure what to do. I thought it was dangerous for me to eat it, but I thought maybe it would be okay. So I ate a little, but it wasn't okay. And I started to have a reaction, so I didn't eat any more. Soon the professor noticed that she wasn't eating anymore and pulled a bit of a face. It wasn't to the point of a really bad face, but it was more of a, why do you show such an attitude to this delicious food face? It became difficult and the air became bad, a bit bad. Yamamoto-san was acu acutely sensitive to the responses of those around her, especially the professor who wanted to treat them. A young man at the workshop, Saito-san, however, was confused about why she hadn't just said she couldn't eat it. And he, he asked her, had it been a gathering of a zemi, a seminar that she was a member of, with the implication that she would know all the members very well. And she replied that it wasn't, it was a gathering of her professor and some of her seniors, her senpai. So she didn't know them well. Her dilemma of disclosure was thus exacerbated by her positionality. She was out with people considered socially senior who were not well known. One of the other participants asked if Yamamoto-san had told them of her allergies prior to the meal, and she replied, no, I didn't. I only really thought of it when I had the reaction because I thought it would be okay. But also I felt they wouldn't understand if I said about it. That was the feeling I got. I felt it would be hard to explain to them. It would be tough. They would not react well. I thought they wouldn't really understand it. And it was a professor and my senpai, my seniors. She didn't know them well, she didn't feel comfortable, and she was concerned about their reactions. However, her ability to, to disclose was also mediated by the unfolding situation. The fact that she felt pressure as the most junior person at the table, wanted to make a good impression by going with the flow. The reaction she saw from her professor when she stopped eating also made her feel and consequently imagine that they wouldn't understand about her allergies if she had said about it. Feeling her way through the social event, she was reading the air and imagining what their responses would be. Other participants of the workshop indicated that they were surprised by the decisions she had made. They thought it would have been potentially less awkward if she had declared she had allergies outright and explained why she couldn't eat any more of it. That way her reluctance to eat might have been received as unavoidable rather than being potentially picky as indicated by the you know, professor making a face. Her management of the situation, however, came about through those feelings in the interaction and how she imagined their reactions. Yet other participants' imaginations were that if Yamamoto-san had declared, then she wouldn't have been thought to be difficult or ungrateful by the professor she was with. If indeed that was what the professor thought, right, we don't know. In teasing out how to understand imagination in practices of disclosure and reading the air, I turned to work by Sneath, Holbrad, and Peterson, who argued that there is, uh, and I quote, an external imaginary space spanning between persons or between persons and things 
and that such external spaces are often constitutive of imaginative projects as they serve to delineate the particular vistas on which that which is imagined assumes its form, end quote. The air in which food allergy disclosures are delivered is, I would argue, just such an external imaginary space. The reading of the air becomes both an imaginative and interpretive practice. And they're trying to ascertain, adapt to, and mitigate that atmosphere in which they're making their disclosures, but it is fundamentally uncertain. There is no one way to manage allergies socially. It's a felt process, and it's also affected by previous experiences. The fact that Yamamoto-san couldn't remember the last time she'd reacted to prawns and thought optimistically that maybe her tolerance levels had increased was also linked to the fact that she hadn't had a severe reaction for a long time. For participants whose reactions were severe or for those who were managing multiple allergies, eating out without disclosing wasn't an option. In such cases, they might try to avoid eating or socializing altogether, often because they felt annoyed at the social and financial costs of management. Much of the work on mewaku focuses primarily on not causing trouble to others. But the following narratives illustrate that people with food allergies are also trying not to create mewaku for themselves. 20-year-old Arai-san, for example, was allergic to six foods and said the following. I joined a circle at university, but nomikai, after, after event get-togethers, are expensive, and we all have to pay the same amount, even if we only drink a soft drink and don't eat much. So I feel sorry to my parents every time I pay money for things I don't eat and drink. Spending that time seems a bit stupid to me. As a result, I haven't attended any after, drink, after club drinks at all. And I know people say I'm bad at relationships. When I went on the training camp, the Gashku, with the club, it was pretty awkward. One of the participants of the workshop interrupted at this point to ask her if she hadn't told people about her allergies and if that was why she was expected to pay the same as everybody else. But Arai-san replied, I haven't hidden my allergies. For example, when I went to the training camp, the Gashku, I was told by the place that they couldn't cater for me, so I took my own food and I just asked them to warm it up for me. I was the only one with allergies at the camp, and I was the only one who was eating different food from everyone else. Then, of course, people would ask me why, and I explained about my allergies. Then they would ask what I can't eat, and I would give them the list. Then they would exclaim, wow, that's a lot. What do you eat? And everyone at this point started laughing. She continued, it would be fine if it was just once, but it's never just once. And it's so annoying. There was a lot of people in the group. So at every meal, I would end up having the same conversation with different people. and I really don't like it. So it's for this reason that I avoid dining out with the university circle and others where possible. Kanako-san, a 22-year-old woman, concurred and said about her experiences. Originally, the schedule of the club activities at university wasn't great for me, but there was also a lot of after-club get-togethers on Nomikai. These are expensive, even though there's not much I can eat or drink. I can drink alcohol now, she's above the age of drinking, so it's fun with those people. So if it's fun with those people, I can think, never mind, about spending money for food I don't eat. For me, it's a balance between how much enjoyment I get from drinking with this group of people and how much it costs when I can't eat anything that is there. If it's people I know and like, I go. As the vignettes presented so far illustrate, the participants had different strategies about eating or not eating, socializing or not socializing. Yet underlying these narratives was a concern to either not cause trouble to others or a desire to not experience trouble themselves. Arai-san felt acutely aware that her disclosure and strategies for safe eating made the atmosphere awkward, and she felt she was judged as being bad at relationships. Others commiserated and suggested that reading others' reactions, handling the questions and the exclamations about what they can and can't eat, imagining the pity they felt in some of these exclamations about what they can eat, uh, was such that disclosing was a difficult thing to do. Kaneko san meanwhile, underscored that the relationships involved are critical in the experience and management of disclosure and eating. 
If it was a small group of people she knew well, socializing is not an issue. She felt confident to say places to go. She felt comfortable to pay her share. It came down to how much enjoyment she thought she'd feel versus the financial cost she'd have to pay. In groups of people she didn't feel comfortable with or didn't know well, she would typically try and avoid attending. Through these encounters, these young adults were imagining and experiencing responses to their strategies to eat or not eat safely based on their reading of the air and their desire to not have trouble. This is mitigated by who they are with, the environment they're in, their economic values and economic situation, their past experiences of allergy disclosure, which shapes the kinds of actions they then subsequently take. Of course, the number of allergies and the kinds of reactions they've previously had are also relevant. People with multiple allergies or those who've had experience of anaphylaxis tend to be much more cautious about disclosure and management, but they're also much more likely to not attend social events wherever possible. In the following section, I turn to how feelings of mewafu can also emerge from practices of care. As is already clear from the previous narratives, I hope, for many, disclosing their allergies leads to feeling bothered by others as a result of others' responses and actions. Araisan, for example, mentioned that she finds others' attempts to be caring and careful on her behalf tiring and sometimes difficult to deal with. And she said, After knowing about my allergies, people will suggest we go and eat somewhere I can eat. They are being kind and nice, but they don't understand that I find it tiring to actually look for a place where I could eat. They don't realize how much time it takes for me to look. I don't go out to eat much and I have lots of allergies, so it's hard to find somewhere to go. I have the same amount of reports and essays and things to do at university as they do. Plus, then I have to look for the place where we can eat so that I can eat safely. It takes a lot of time, but they don't know that. They think they're making it easier for me, but actually it's not. They don't believe me when I say it's totally fine for them to go where they were planning to go, and please don't worry about it. 19-year-old Sato-san agreed. He also added that he did not like to be seen to be different. When I asked him why this was the case, he forcefully replied, why don't I like it? I want to live normally. Everybody laughed. I don't want people around me to think I'm different. I guess it's because I think of my allergies as a weakness within me. Of course, I don't want to show my weakness. For Sato-san, feeling different is unwanted. In our discussions, he indicated that it feels stigmatizing. Yang and Kleiman et al. have argued that stigma is, and I quote, a fundamentally moral issue in which stigmatized conditions threaten what really matters for sufferers. In turn, responses arise out of what matters to those observing, giving care, or stigmatizing. Here, what matters to these social, in, in, I can never say this word, interlocutors, I can allay or compound conditions, end quote. What matters to Satosan is being seen to be normal. For him, this means to be able to eat out with others without having to disclose his allergies or check ingredients and to not receive care from others. Not being able to do this was deeply uncomfortable, so he would prefer to just not socialize. Most of the participants disagreed with Satosan about food allergies being a weakness or a failing in themselves, but they were frustrated by having to remind people that they have allergies because of course others forget, that's, that's normal, or because others express pity. For example, one young woman said, and I quote, they make this face and say, oh, you can't eat strawberry shortcake? That's so sad, how I saw. Feeling as if they were being pitied was something that most of them found incredibly difficult to handle. Though some, as I will talk about in a minute, reject these ideas. Although some people talked of experiencing negative responses to their allergy disclosure, it's not just practices or experiences of negative discrimination that cause people to feel stigmatized due to allergies. Instead, it is the feeling of difference they experience when care is displayed by others after they disclose. 
care causes them trouble because it highlights their difference when they just want to blend in. In critical disability studies, Overbow and Campbell have both, uh, both argued that this urge or motivation to, quote, emulate the norm occurs through the internalization of ableism, end quote. Now, just to be clear, people in Japan with food allergies typically don't think of their food allergies as constituting a disability. However, it does create a sense of difference and the desire to maintain the atmosphere to, to facilitate smooth relationships in social situations where the underlying assumption is that everyone can eat the same foods could be understood as a form of internalized ableism where difference is assumed by them to be problematic. The provision of care and the reception of care further reinforces this feeling. Some participants rejected the suggestion that disclosure of food allergy was problematic or difficult. This emerged clearly at a workshop when a participant asked Tanaka-san, a man in his mid-20s, how often he attended work-related drinking parties. His response, almost all, shocked her. Another woman in her mid-20s, Yamada-san, concurred. She said, me too, about once a week. This elicited exclamations of surprise from the other participants. And building on this, my Japanese co-facilitator ventured a question to them all. There'll be things you can eat, but depending on the restaurant, right? Some places are easier than others. But if there isn't anything you can eat, what do you do? What do you say? I only became able to say, she had food allergies as well. I only became able to say, I can't eat that once I became an adult because I got older. I couldn't say anything, even in my 30s, because I was worried about it. I was careful of others. So I really wonder what you all do. Tanaka-san, with a shrug, responded that he says right at the beginning. When I got my current job, we went for training and then for drinks, and I said straight away about it. I don't really think about it. I don't pay much attention to it. I just say about it. For this young man, not paying attention to his, how his disclosure was received and understood was the main way he operated. He was matter of fact and unfazed by talking about his allergies. Others in the group responded again with surprise and another participant asked him uh, what the reaction to his disclosure was like. And he replied, oh, they responded with, oh, okay, well, in that case, can you, you can eat this, right? So please take more of it and eat. He was a little confused that others didn't feel comfortable with the responses they received after disclosing their allergies. 23-year-old Watanabe-san suggested that people with food allergies can themselves create a positive atmosphere through their own affects. When people say it's tough not to be able to eat something, I reply cheerfully, that's not the case. I think that if I engage with it positively, then others' image and impression of me will likewise change. People around me are helpful. They care about it when it comes to food, but otherwise they don't see me as pitiable, as being pitiable. So I think it's important to be positive because it changes the way people relate to us. By managing disclosure through cheerful rebuttals and positivity, Watanabe-san didn't find his social interactions to be difficult, and he wasn't worried about how others thought of him or if he was being a burden. Yet he did affectively engage proactively with impression management through his cheerful replies and positive engagement. He felt he could influence others' responses by how he disclosed and how he then reacted to their reactions of his disclosure. But at the same time, both he and Tanaka-san managed only one allergy each. For people with multiple allergies, it's far more complicated. Whose responsibility is it to manage the air? In general, the literature of reading the air suggests it to be a collaborative, intersubjective, communicative endeavor with everyone attempting to attune to the air they find themselves in. The ease of reading and constructing the air is also understood to be affected by the socio-psychological distance of those present. Yet many allergic people at the uh, workshops felt significant pressure or responsibility to the air around them. They didn't just attune themselves, but they felt they had to manage it or construct it. This was especially so in cases when they were socializing with people outside of their close friends. 
After their disclosure, they often heard the curious query of what can you eat? And although this may be meant with the best of intentions by non-allergic people in Japan, heard over and over again, it reinforces for some a sense of difference and shifts the, the atmosphere, turning attention towards them and their difference. This can then engender a feeling they have to manage the air to deflect it. And for some, this is through jokes and cheerfulness, but for others, they just didn't feel able. Before moving to the conclusion, I want to briefly turn to parents and parental pe perspectives on meiwaku. For the most part, the parents I've talked with didn't focus overly on a sense of creating trouble for others or reading the air. Some parents talked about being careful to check the school lunch menu for their child's allergens so they could substitute a safe food to not create trouble for the school. Or they talked about feeling sorry that they'd caused trouble to coworkers when they'd had to leave early because their child had had an allergic reaction. But you know, that's if your child has a fever, the same thing happens, right? They talked more about doing what they have to do to keep their kids safe. So some parents really don't understand why young adults are so concerned with feelings of trouble. Kitagawa-san, a mother to a 19-year-old son and a 17-year-old daughter, both with allergies, for example, said the following. I think it's better to do what you can within the limits of what you can do for each other, even if it means causing trouble. And I know there are some high school students who don't want people to know about their allergies, but I don't understand it. I think it would be easier to just openly say that this and that food are not good, but they say, I don't want to create trouble. But I think it's only natural to deal with it. For Kitagawa-san, one of the reasons why young people struggle with a feeling of creating trouble, she said, is that mothers have done their best and protected their child too much. An albeit extreme example of this was visible at the 2019 camp put on by the uh, organization that I've been working with. On the morning the camp was starting, I sat down to share a cup of tea with several of the organizers who'd gathered before all the participants began arriving from 11 a.m. It quickly became apparent that they were annoyed and frustrated. One of the women leaned in and quietly told me that one family who they'd spent a considerable amount of time with on the phone over the previous couple of months coming up with compromises and solutions to their fears and demands had suddenly left a message that they weren't going to attend. The director was trying to get hold of them, but they weren't picking up. And so the head cook in the outdoor kitchen was waiting to hear the verdict. If they weren't coming, it would simplify his kitchen operations for the next three days considerably. The crux of the issue was that the mother had insisted that they not serve foods that her child hadn't tried before, regardless of whether they'd had an allergy to it or not. And she was being very specific about how she wanted the kitchen team to avoid any potential cross contact with these foods, in addition to the actual allergies her child had, because she didn't want to risk a reaction at the camp. The director recounted how the mother's fear and imaginings of what could happen if they didn't follow her demands, was controlling not just what they could do to try and find solutions, but was limiting what the family could do in their daily lives. Moreover, they had obviously caused considerable trouble to the camp organizers who are very well versed. They've been doing it for 25 years. They know how to keep people safe. In the end, of course, it was a relief to the organizing team that they didn't have to go to extensive lengths in addition to running a camp for more than 100 people at the height of a hot and sticky summer. The, direct, the director, excuse me, was, however, frustrated because she felt that people who avoid food out of fear of possibly being allergic is making it harder for people with diagnosed allergies to speak up. She argued that this behavior leads to a loss of trust in people who do disclose their allergies. Instead of it being taken seriously, she suggested that such individuals make it seem as if people with allergies are just being fussy and by stating that foods that they are not willing for their children to eat, they're creating misunderstandings. The director was also frustrated because she thinks the camp is a perfect place to try new things, given that everyone knows how to uh, identify anaphylaxis and they're trained in using epinephrine auto-injectors. She understands the anxiety and fear that food allergies engender, but she argued that people have to learn to live with it and do things anyway, even if they're scared. Later that afternoon, surrounded by parents for the adult orientation, the director used the experience to reinforce what the camp provides. And she told the attendees, we understand the anxiety and we don't want to provide a place of bad experiences. This is a place where you can challenge. If you can challenge a new food, a new experience here, 
you can challenge elsewhere too. She continued by encouraging the parents to leave their children alone while at the camp to let them learn to take some responsibility for themselves. For the directors and organizers, one of the challenges for kids with food allergies and allergic disease is learning how to manage their conditions because parents do tend to be pretty on top of it. Kitagawa-san reflected this view when she had told me that if allergic children are too protected, they struggle to say about it and become overly concerned with causing trouble to others. Now, before we start mother bashing, um, I just wanna point out that while this view is relevant to some, it assumes that disclosure of allergies is the same regardless of positionality. For parents, disclosure is about their children, not themselves. And it's generally understood, so long as it's not taken too far, to be something necessary to keep their child safe. It's a key part of a parent's, and often specifically in Japan, a mother's responsibility. The stakes are different, however, for individuals disclosing their own allergies because they did risk being seen as difficult, selfish, fussy individuals. There was no social role through which they could mediate the disclosure and therefore the air became an indicator for how or if to disclose. So my conclusions. Reading the air and its connections to causing or avoiding trouble lead to a variety of actions based on individuals' past experiences and their assessment of others' responses, which includes an imagination of what other people mean by their responses. For many, concern to not create trouble for others and themselves because of their allergies leads to diverse practices of disclosure and management. But I would say that reading the air and meiwaku are not just cultural concepts that are important in the development and maintenance of smooth social relations in Japan. They are also bodily capacities and practices of imagination and interpretation. These concepts are somatic and they're embedded and practiced within what Sneath and Holbrod and Peterson have said is an external imaginary space spanning between people or between people and things. Effectively imagining others' responses through practices of reading the air and mewaku is influenced by their past embodied experience, but it leads to a variety of affects, actions, and effects. These affects and feelings consequently condition how and to what extent people with food allergies engage in food-related sociality. Their, imagine, their imagination of what could happen physically and socially is also producing affects through their disclosures, their desire to not create trouble or be troubled, and their imaginations of others' responses. It's intersubjective, it's interpretive, it's based on others, but it might not be accurate. How one person with food allergies reads the air and tries not to create trouble for others and themselves varies, as I hope the narratives have shown. But it is also, I would say, as much about their relationship to their allergies and how they manage the difference they feel results from their allergies that is critical to keep in mind. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I really look forward to any questions and comments that you might have. Thank you so much, Professor Cook. Yeah. Any questions in the room? I'm also looking at the questions. Nothing yet has come in from our Zoom audience, but we welcome questions, comments. Thank you so much. So interesting. So food allergy must be increasing quite a bit across the globe, right? So I, I wonder if you might place this in comparative perspective. So what do they happen in London or UK yeah. or Ann Arbor? Well, I couldn't really speak to Ann Arbor because of COVID. I haven't really eaten out particularly much. Um, I think, I mean, in the UK, definitely there is concern about feeling different. There is concern about how to manage. But the culture around food, I think, is markedly different and really mitigates how much they feel. So, for example, all of you know, if you've been in Japan, you go out for dinner with people, you're in izakaya. There are probably eight, nine different dishes on the table. Everybody shares. Um, everyone takes onto little plates. In the UK, you order your own meal, right? It's an individual plate. So the management of the actual allergy with the staff and with the chef and with the manager is already a lot easier. If you imagine having six allergies, and you have to ask wait staff about 
all six of those allergies in eight different dishes. It's just, it's just too much. So um, definitely there is this sense um, that I think is important in terms of what the food culture is. Um, but I would also say that in the UK, there's a lot more understanding. I mean, there's a lot of sort of pushback as well, but you know, there are vegans and there are vegetarians and there are people who eat halal foods and there are people who um, are, I wanted to say paleontologists, but that's totally wrong, pescatarians. Um, <laughs> Definitely not paleontologists. Um, so I think there is also a sense of understanding that people will eat different foods and have different preferences. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're difficult. Uh, of course, you know, there's pushback with veganism these days, there's pushback with gluten free. So there are people out there who are like, you guys are all a nightmare. But um, I think generally that sense of difference is less pronounced in the UK than in, in Japan. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for a great talk. My question is about sort of the temporality of meiwaku, mm -hmm. because I the sense I got from your talk, especially for these sort of young adults trying to disclose for their own safety, that the meiwaku is a very instantaneous short-term solution, like fear slash solution, that it's about mitigating the air for that instance, and less about like long-term safety for themselves, as well as long avoiding long-term meiwaku by not disclosing to their friends or colleagues. And that I was curious if um, any of the people you've talk to are kind of aware of sort of thinking about temporality and like their lives or if, if their anxiety is very much focused on sort of this individualized moments of disclosure um, and uh, situ potentially harmful situations they're in rather than thinking about sort of a collective safety, including uh, their not putting their friends in a position of seeing you have an anaphylaxis shock state. Um, so I'm very curious about like that. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, yes, definitely in the moment. The, a lot of the concern with Meiwaku is definitely about that. But I think it's also about trying to mitigate the Meiwaku they're going to feel in the future when they have to keep declaring. So. Primarily, it is this instantaneous short aspect, but in their minds, I think for many of them, it is also linked to trying to offset future trouble. Um, now, I mean, I only focused on young adults here. Many of them are university students. This becomes way more complex when they start working. It's incredibly complicated. Um, and many of them have tried different strategies in the workplace to have others be understanding. But usually what happens is if they're managing multiple allergies, they pull back, they just don't attend. And so the long-term effects of that, potentially on promotion, on you know, how they are viewed within the workplace if they don't participate, um, is yet to be seen. Many of them talked about COVID as being kind of a blessing because they didn't have to manage any of these things. It didn't look strange if they were like, I'm not coming to this event because, you know, COVID. Um, so, yeah, and as to collective safety, I mean, I think, you know, this is what the nonprofit organization has really been trying to do. It's all about trying to educate the wider public about food allergies in order for there to be increased awareness that not everyone is going to eat the same food. It's okay to not eat the same food. And they talk a lot about how their sort of mission is to make difference be, being different be okay, be normal. Um, but that's very much a long term sort of engagement that they're working on. Um, for most of people with food allergies, it's much more individualized in the moment, I would say. I hope that's answered your question. And if it hasn't, come back to me and I, and I can take a second stab at it. We have a comment and a question on Zoom. So John Campbell has a comment. Thanks, John, for being with us. Um, the Japan anthropologist Susan Long has many food allergies, and she carries a list of them in both English and Japanese. We have often eaten with her in both the U.S. and Japan, 
And so as far as I know, she does the same, she does it the same way and is received the same way. Of, co of course, there is difference. That is different than the examples here, but interesting. And then Kate Goldfarb, who was just visiting us last week and uh, has a wonderful set of questions. Um, hi, Kate, thank you for making time to be here too. Um, she says, thank you so much for this talk. Um, she joined a little late, but had two questions. One is about using the word disclosure in English, and she's wondering what the word is people typically use in Japan and Japanese. She's asking because in her research, um, the term dis disclosure comes up around the fact of adoption. Um, and there's often discussion of the fact that this implies something shameful and secretive. Um, is there a kind of similar nuance here? Is it um, something like that? And maybe she's typing the second question because that's all that's here. Okay. Thanks, Kate. So first of all, back to, to John Campbell. Um, yeah, that's a great comment. Thank you very much. I didn't know that Susan Long had lots of allergies. Um, I would say that, um, you know, a lot of people in Japan in restaurants, they are really good. They take it seriously. A lot of chefs know what is in the food. It depends on where you go. A lot of um, uh, family sort of restaurants like Denny's, they have lists of the main allergens. So, so long as you're listed within those kind of main allergens, those are your allergens, you can find places to eat. It's much more about their feelings, right? It's not so much about how others are receiving them per se, but how they're imagining other people are thinking about what they're saying. Um, and so that's why I sort of talked a little bit about kind of the sense of stigma they feel, the sense of difference they feel. It's, it's not so much about what other people are doing, even though they read it that way. Um, as to Kate, um, yeah, I mean, I've basically been using disclosure. They normally just usually use to tell, to say, although one woman did actually phrase it as coming out to no timing when to come out, which I thought was a really kind of interesting sort of phrase to use um, and sort of really linking to other people, you know, in Japan, other groups, you know, LGBTQ groups in Japan that, you know, feel that they are sort of forced or have to come out in a particular way. Um, so I think that there is definitely, um, definitely it's important, the, the ways that people phrase it are important. I wouldn't say that they themselves think that saying is inherently um, problematic or nuanced in the same way as it is in, in Kate's work. Um, but the feeling that is embedded within the saying is, I think, very much there for some, not for all. Wonderful. Thank you. That's cute. Yeah, oh, thank please go ahead. Great. Um, thank you so much for this lecture. It was very interesting. Um, your comment on the UK sparked a question for me. I was wondering how or if these people that you spoke with um, interacted in spaces with people who have chosen certain diets like veganism, vegetarianism. I know the population is rather small in Japan, but there is still a growing number of people who are choosing different ways of eating. And if that has like allowed them to feel less meiwaku or something like that. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, in some interviews that I did in 2022, this didn't really come up. Oh, a couple of workshops, it did come up. Um, yes, definitely. Uh, so the increase, if they were in Tokyo, the increase in, for example, vegan spaces, if they were allergic to dairy, for example, um, did definitely talk about a sense of relief that they could suggest going to a vegan place, that a lot of their girlfriends, for example, had become interested in trying out these kind of oshare, fashionable vegan places. Um, so definitely those spaces have helped. Uh, for parents as well, parents have also taught less about the ease of going and more about, well, hey, if there's more kind of understanding, acceptance, awareness of different kinds of dietary practices, such as vegetarianism and veganism, then, hey, that means difference is starting to be seen as something that is all right, at least in terms of food. Um, I also want to just stress that I'm not kind of making the argument here that Japanese people are like homogenous and that they're expected to all be the same, you know, that old argument. That's definitely not what I'm arguing. Um, you know, I'm, it's basically that their feeling of this gives them a sense of difference that they don't like, right? It's not being imposed upon them necessarily. Um, but definitely these increase in spaces of different restaurants is, is I think, helping for sure. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, you kind of already spoke to this um, with Karen's comment, but I had a question um, kind of you touched on how the existence of multiple allergies can kind of 
uh, have bearing on the perception of Maywaku. So I want to ask um, if the type of allergy in your research had any bearing um, in your observations um, for that perception, like, for example, if it were a more commonly labeled allergy or um, if like shellfish allergies or different types of allergies had different sort of associations. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, definitely. So um, if you are, if you have allergies that are within those top seven, um, then normally places have information about them. So the, the kind of maneuvering, the ease of asking is a little bit easier. That being said, if you have five of the top seven, then, then it's, still, it's still tricky, right? Um, there are people who, I've met a number of people in Hokkaido, for example, a lot of people have oral food allergies, what's it called? Oh, oral pollen syndrome. So basically um, there's a, people that have particular allergies to pollen can have cross reactivity with certain foods like stone fruit, like plums and peaches and kiwi and things like that. Um, and I've met a few people on, in Hokkaido that have different kinds of citrus allergies and they're not labeled. And if you go to a restaurant, you normally can't get information on them. So if you add those kinds of allergies in with you know, one of the top one or two or one of the top seven, then um, it can be difficult. I would say that there's a lot of awareness around shellfish allergy in Japan, comparatively, I would say, than with matsutake mushroom, for example, or, um, I don't know, I mean, yeah, fish is pretty unusual. Um, only a couple of the fish are labeled, so um, that's typically kind of unusual. There are some people that are allergic to rice, uh, which is actually a really complicated one to handle. Wheat is extremely complicated to handle in Japan. So um, definitely their perception of meiwaku is influenced by how easy it is to get information on the type of allergies that they have, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, and public perception differs on the different kinds of allergies, I would say. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, uh, sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, when you were uh, responding Professor Shibayama's questions about this uh, comparative perspective, I just kept thinking about the, the UK as yeah. well and um, how perhaps in some contexts um, there may be more options available depending on social class. Um, so I wonder whether social class is also uh, may also be an important factor in determining some of these affects that you were discussing today. And um, I also wonder if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit more about uh, the social implications of of um, of these um, of of these uh, of the effects that allergies uh, cause on socialization. I mean, can that limit um, job opportunities or I mean, what kind of broader implications it, it may have? Uh, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's a really important question. Um, social class, I mean, as we all know, it can be complex in the Japanese context. Um, I would say that the vast majority of the people I've worked with are middle, middle, lower middle. Um, some, I think, come from families who have um, far fewer resources. Um, the NPO has also worked with uh, families who are in, you know, financial distress, who are, in, you know, working class or, you know, struggling. Um, I would say that, yes, it definitely has an impact in terms, not so much necessarily, well, let me pull that back, hang on, let me, let me reframe this. Um, so free from foods. In Japan, you can get the top seven allergen free foods from places like Eon supermarkets. So they're more expensive, right? It's exactly the same in the UK. If you look at the cost of living crisis in the UK right now, um, people with food allergies in families are being hit really hard because the difference in the increase in cost between uh, a regular pint of milk 
and the equivalent of almond milk or oat milk is just radically different. It's just way more expensive. So um, there are people definitely who are struggling to feed their kids nutritious meals with the different sort of with you know um, substitutions. But again, it depends on the allergy. So if you've got a wheat allergy, it can be really difficult. If you've got a dairy allergy, it can be really difficult. When it comes to um, socializing in workplaces, um, I think it really depends on the kind of workplace you're in and the kind of culture within that workplace. So I think uh, if you were in a small to mid-sized company, which a lot of people who, for example, don't go to university end up in those, those kinds of companies, um, then the practice of nomikai, I think, is, is perhaps not as pushed to the same degree it is, as it is in larger companies. So I think there will probably be differences there. Um, as to social implications uh, in terms of socialization and jobs, um, definitely. I mean, parents will say things like, well, my son wants to be a firefighter. There's no way he can be a firefighter. He can't be a policeman. He can't be in the self-defense forces. Um, number one, they won't accept people. Or if you're a firefighter, firefighters all share the cooking. You can't create mewaku to have all of them cater for your allergies for every meal. So those kinds of um, things are being already sort of substituted out. Um, I also had interviews with, for example, one guy who's now 28. Uh, in his first job, Nomikai were basically mandatory. Um, and he really struggled. He quit his job as a result. When he was back on the job market, he decided to declare, I have food allergies. And in one of these interviews, the person turned around to him and said, well, you can't do the job then. And he was like, what, what do you mean I can't do the job? And so they didn't hire him. So it was a blatant case of discrimination. But in the Japanese context, your, the Employment Promotion Act protect, protects against discrimination, but only direct discrimination with intent to discriminate. So you'd have to prove that. Um, I mean, you could argue that there was intent to discriminate in that case, but he went to Hello Work, the governmental work uh, agency, and he told them about his experiences. And they basically turned around to him and said, you need to find a place that doesn't care about your food allergies. Good luck. So it can, it can be problematic if you tell about it in an interview. Uh, and it definitely does affect what people think they might be able to do going forward in their careers. Yeah, does that answer your question? Um, so we have a question. We have a couple more questions coming in via Zoom. Thanks again to everyone. Adam Sorkin asks a question that then you sort of started to address. So he then commented. So thank you, Adam, for, for staying on, on board with us. Um, so Adam asks, what uh, anal uh, analogous, but it may be analogies, exist to the discomfort around and treatment of allergies in Japan. Are there through lines around discomfort and meiwaku that cut across different issues? And I think he was later referring to the coming out phrasing. If I may, I'd like to add on, and you can separate these in your head, but as, as even before you said the coming out point or the phrasing there, I was actually thinking about how my American students here um, have sort of believed that if a family doesn't all have the same family name, that they won't love each other the same way. Have, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you asked young people? How many people have a different last name than their parents? I do. Okay, so thank you for raising your hand so high. I appreciate it. Um, it's been this, I, partially because I teach about surname issues and gender in Japan courses, right? Because uh, sort of for obvious reasons. Um, one of the things I've been really struck by is that people who don't grow up with a different last name, um, feel like one of the things that makes their family a family and one of the reasons to explain the love that they share and connection and relationality that they share is the last name. But for those of us who grew up with different last names, like I am my mother's head stuck on my father's body. Like it's very clear that I'm related to both of them. Um, and it's, it's very clear to me that with no offense intended, it's not the name that makes us close, right? Um, and so I was wondering, and Adam, I hope you don't mind if I'm piggybacking on your question, but like those kinds of things where it's a very sweet misunderstanding, but that's not, that's not what makes you, you love each other and care about each other, right? Um, but it does feel like a necessary item for people who grew up within that system. 
Yeah, no, it's both great comments and questions. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to Adam, I mean, it's, I mean, I've only just started sort of looking at, you know, some of the critical disability studies work. Um, I would say that it cross cuts anywhere that people feel that difference is problematic in Japan. Um, that sense of creating difficulty for others, I think is such a taught thing when people are young, that definitely it cross cuts. Um, I've been really hesitant to kind of discuss disability in the sense that these people don't think of themselves as having a disability. But the fact that they don't think of, of this kind of invisible illness being some form of disability also tells us a lot about how they think about disability and the negative connotations that, that exist about disability within the Japanese context more broadly. So I think there is something to be said there. Um, I do have a chapter that I'm working on that actually deals with this sort of sense of, you know, people with food allergies themselves talk about it as a being with, a living with, a kind of skiatiku kind of through life. Whereas some parents do talk about disability in terms of the accommodations that are needed, the effort that is needed to go into creating and organizing safe lunches at schools and, and that kind of thing. So definitely, I think there is something there. And so thank you very much, Adam, for your comment. And I will be thinking about it more. Um, in terms of um, family names, I mean, that's a great comment. I, it just made me think of um, Eon, for example, has this series or have had a series of advertisements for their top seven allergen free meals, which basically goes with a mom in an apron in a kitchen, a dad is sitting or maybe playing with the kids, you know, very typical normative kind of ideology of the Japanese family. And the mom has one pot on the stove and it's got curry in it. And a lot of, for example, curry often has dairy in it. It can be really problematic for kids with top seven allergies. So there's one pot on the stove and then it cuts to this table and they're all sitting around this table and they're all eating the same curry. And it's like one pot, one family, right? So the joy that is expected to be felt from the ability to eat the exact same thing within the family is definitely present. Amazon Japan had, had one about um, rice flour being used to make bread and you know how this kid was suddenly included in everything there was this huge group of kids and it was like look now you can eat the same as everyone else this is amazing so that definitely exists and the director of the uh, the organization I've worked with is really on the fence about this she's like we want difference to be understood as being okay but what you're basically saying is we're going to create solutions for you all to eat the same thing and keep doing what everyone sort of expects you to be able to do. So it kind of undermines the kinds of messaging that they think are needed, you know, in their work in Japan. Um, but yes, definitely, the food, same food and relationality and family is is definitely a discourse that runs through. Hi, thank you so much for your um, wonderful talk. Really appreciate it. Um, I was really interested in uh, this question of allergy management historically. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how allergies were managed in previous historical moments in time. I mean, I know at a certain level, probably a lot of this is very contemporary because of uh, you know the way in which work culture is set up in Japan. But I also wonder, you know, for example, in uh, and probably in previous times, uh, people ate at their homes more instead of eating out. But uh, I'm sure there must have been a lot of times when uh, group eating was required. I think about it, you know, especially, for example, in wartime, you know, how did they manage recruits who had allergies, uh, you know, when they're having, you know, this very close communal, you know, structure uh, of eating and, uh, you know, cohabiting, et cetera. Um, things like that, I guess, uh, is, is what your presentation kind of sparked to me as questions. Right. Gosh, that's a brilliant question. Um, and now I really want to go back to all the historical material. Um, I have to be honest, um, I can't tell you anything about wartime eating practices uh, at this point, but now you've made me, me think about it. But there are some things I can say about post-war Japan um, and definitely about allergies um, in those previous times. So um, 
yes, food allergies are very much a contemporary issue and it is, has increased, but yes, people have definitely had them for a long time before. The director of the nonprofit organization, she's in her 60s. And when she was a child, um, she had food allergies and very severe asthma. And it was so bad and um, not managed that she was so ill that she couldn't go to school. So she was basically kind of homeschooled, but not really. It's kind of amazing. She ended up with a sociology degree later on in life. Um, and she would sort of talk about how she would just have these huge asthma attacks where, you know, it's, it's amazing she, she's alive, if you think about it, um, but would just kind of make her bed bound. So, you know, how that was managed historically, I don't know. You know, whether it was the invalid in the house who didn't go out, um, or people that you know had reactions and died from asthma attacks, for example. I, I don't know, I don't have the data, but I can imagine it's a possibility. Um, her son, who is now in his 40s, um, also had food allergies. And she talks a lot about how she used to go up to a blackboard in any school event, and she would basically, she learned all about sort of the immunological sort of aspects of allergies. And she would basically write on the board, you know, what was happening, and what needed to be done and how to keep people safe. So that's where her kind of activism began from, that lived experience. Um, but yeah, um, I will definitely go and start looking at the historical material. Thank you very much for pushing me in that direction. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm sorry, we're out of time and I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions on Zoom either, but um, I think maybe Professor Cook can stick around for a few minutes and I'll share the Zoom questions with you later. Thank you for this wonderful talk and thank you all for being here and for sharing your ideas. Thank you. And I, I would just like to say thank you so much for masking. I really appreciate that everyone put a mask on to allow me to speak freely today. So thank you.